Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. Amen. Hi, everybody. It's a real privilege to be here once again. I uh, really don't take this lightly to be able to stand and preach the Word of God and uh, just to look at an issue with you tonight. I'm uh, stalling a little bit because Pastor Tom's got to do the 100 meters and he's got to get way to the back of the church and get himself set up in uh, my usual spot, which is on the controls for the live stream. And he's just about arrived and he's waving at me, so praise God. Uh, When Pastor Tom asked me to uh, minister tonight, I thought, hmm, what was it that we really need to consider right now? And uh, the Lord dropped on me this idea of the subject of patience. And I've got a nice graphic there for you just on the subject of patience. Now, this won't be by any means the last word on patience. When I uh, went and had a look, there's lots of scriptures on patience in the New Testament. Surprising amount. And you think, what does the Bible have to say about patience? This is kind of a, a real small secondary issue, but it isn't when you begin to look at the scriptures. So tonight we could go in all kinds of different directions on the subject of patience, but I just basically want to pick up one thought and one theme, and let's take a look at it together. And um, the thing about patience is, as I said, you really don't give too much thought to it very many times, uh, until, of course, you've lost it. <laughs> you realize you've lost your patience, or somebody else has lost their patience with you. And then the subject of patience becomes really important, and we suddenly realize how much impact it can have on our lives. But I wonder tonight, in these current situations, have you been losing patience with the time scales that things are going on? You know, the restrictions, we chafe against them. We, ah, I wish this was over. I wish I could go out and do this different things. For me, the number one thing that I miss the most that makes me feel impatient, I need a haircut. Amen. I'm really looking forward to getting a proper, nice, short, zizzy haircut. Get this weight out of the back. I feel like a sheepdog. And so you can probably relate to some of those things. But I wonder, I mean, I look back. And I think about it, and I think about the lives of other people in my own life, and there are times when I've lost patience with God. And I wonder, have you ever lost patience with God? You're probably all sitting there going, well, no, you know, I've never really done that. I'm so holy and spiritual, but hey, I've lost patience with God from time to time. And I think if you're honest, we can say, you know, there are times in my life when I've become impatient with God. What do I mean by impatient with God? Well, The thing about God is that his time frame is so different to ours. (laughs) Yes. And that is because his perspective is so different to ours. I've got a scripture here that illustrates exactly what I mean. And uh, I've not got all these to go on the uh, screens tonight for you. There'd be too many of them. But if you've got a Bible, uh, look look them up. You know, if you've got a phone, you can look them up. If it's too quick and it's too fast and you want to go back and catch them again, we have an awesome podcast service. This message will be podcasted at 10 p.m. tonight. And also, once it appears on YouTube, you can even get it on there with the video. So don't worry, this won't go past you. You can catch up again. But look with me, Psalm 103, verses 15 through 17. This is interesting. The Bible there says, As for man... His days are like grass, like a flower of the field he flourishes, and then the wind passes over it and it is gone, and the place where it was will know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children." This, this passage here is contrasting the way our lives are, the way our perspective is, with the way that God's perspective is. The Bible says our days are like grass. We're here today, we're healthy, we're vibrant, we're vigorous today, and tomorrow we're like grass, we wither like the flower, and the place where we used to bloom forgets us because we're gone, you know, carried away on the, on the, uh, the, the, the rivers of time. Our lives are short Our strength is finite. We only have a certain amount of opportunity on this earth to do what we feel needs to be done. But God, 
He sees the end from the beginning. He's from everlasting to everlasting. Time is not a problem to God. He has as much of it as anyone could ever want. But, you know, from our point of view, we're time limited. We're resource limited. You know, we're acutely aware of this in our lives. So many times we become frustrated because God isn't doing what we want him to do in the time which we wish he'd do it in. You know, we're like, oh God, you know, what's taking place here? Why are we still not able to have church, God? How many weeks has it been? Why don't you just end this pandemic, God? Why don't you bring me a spouse? How long have I been waiting? You know, someday my prince will come. There you go, free song, you know. But we're waiting for that and we're fretting about that and we're getting all stressed out about that. Why don't you heal my infirmity, Lord? Why won't you save my wayward child or my spouse? And we have all these things going round in us. God, do you not understand the urgency? I only have so much time and it's running out why won't you move and we fail to understand God's perspective is so different this is perhaps I think given all the experience I've had the length of time I've been a Christian one of the hardest things I've ever had to learn and I'm not saying I've completely learned it yet because this is kind of something that has more depth to it than you could ever mine you see we have faith that God can do it I'm sure that everybody listening to this and watching this, you'll say, oh yeah, I have faith that God can do these things. He can bring me a spouse. He can end the pandemic. He can save this person. He can open the church. He can part the Red Sea. God's able to do this. But then when God doesn't do it in the time that we think he should do it in, that's when we begin to become impatient with God. And when that impatience sets in, we start to become insecure. We start to become frustrated we start to get fretful and angry and unsettled in our spirits and in, in our approach to life instead of confident and assured and peaceful, which is what faith generates. You see the difference? In patience, when we begin to fall into this, we begin to lose things. We begin to lose things and it makes us ineffective. Here's another scripture for you. Hebrews 10, 35 through 36 the Hebrews here are going through some struggles and the writer is talking to people who are suffering exactly from this situation that I've just described, this impatience with God. And he says, listen, do not throw away your confidence. It has great recompense of reward. And then he says, for you have need of patience. You need patience. It's something you need. So that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. This is interesting. It's saying here, listen, faith on its own is not enough. What you need in your life is faith that's lived out in patience so that you can wait for God to do that thing that he promised and so that you can actually re receive the reward of your faith. Faith lived out through patience. What a challenge this is. Again, in Hebrews 6, 11 to 12, same thing, different verse, same book. And we desire that each one of you shows the same eagerness to the full assurance of hope to the end. As it was at the beginning, we need to continue that through to the end of the matter. That you be not slothful, but imitators of those, here it comes, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Mm. So do we have patient confidence in our troubled and difficult times? Do we have patient confidence in God through this pandemic? Do we have patient confidence in God while we wait for that thing that we so earnestly desire, that we're convinced that God has the power to do and the intention to do because he loves us and he cares for us and he wants to bless us, but we're in this waiting time when he doesn't seem to want to do it on our time scale. Do we have that patient confidence in that time? Can we wait actively in faith and impatience, or are we becoming impatient with God? Are we beginning to become troubled, unsettled, fretful, angry, threatening, feeling driven to kind of taking things into our own hands because we're worried that it's not going to happen? Well, let's explore this idea a little more of waiting patiently for God. We all know the scripture, Romans 8, 28. You can probably recite it from memory, some of you that are listening to this and watching this. I certainly can. It's one of those 
key scriptures for a Christian, and we quote it so glibly. But it's interesting to note that if you read the whole section that that verse is in, this is an entire discussion all about waiting waiting for God to do something that he's promised to do. And it's interesting that this verse appears in the middle of a discussion about waiting. Here's a flavor of it for you. Romans 8, 24 to 25 says here, we're saved by hope, yeah? But hope that is seen isn't hope. Because what a man sees, why would he yet hope for? If we see it, if we have it, hope is not necessary. Waiting is not necessary. Faith is not necessary because we have it in our hands right now. But he says, if we hope for that which we cannot yet see, then we with patience will wait for it. Oh, this is where patience comes in. And then we move on and we see the famous scripture, Romans 8, 28, where it says, and we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So how does that tie in with this idea of waiting? Well, it's very interesting this. I also need to flip over my page. And they're all stuck together. Have patience, praise God. How can paper be sticky? Well, this is the way it works out. If you think about those verses that we read stuck together, what we're basically saying when we have faith and patience is, God, I know that you're going to answer me. I know that you're almighty. I know that you're able to do this. And I also know that you have the very best at heart for me. So I know God because I need this, because I prayed for this, because I'm your child and I have that relationship and you care for me. You want the best for me and you're going to do this. But because I believe those things, I can also believe that you will answer me at the very best time for this to occur. So if I have to wait, Lord... I will wait with patience and joy and expectation and quiet confidence because I know that even what feels to me like a delay is actually you working things out for my ultimate benefit. That's how it works. You see, when we begin to fall into impatience, what's actually taking place if you boil it down and you sit, step back and you think about it long enough and go down to the base issues? Impatience is actually kind of a symptom of unbelief. That's what's taking place in our lives. We're actually beginning to drift into unbelief. We wouldn't call it that necessarily. But if you think it through, that's what's beginning to take place in our lives. Now, all of you that are at all spiritual and and scholars, students of the Bible in any way, you'll immediately go, oh, unbelief, that's really bad. Unbelief is a sin. Unbelief is somewhere we definitely should not go. But when we think about our own impatience, we excuse that. We go, ah, it's just my human nature. It's just my natural frustration as a human person with the delay and the slowness of things. But the Bible actually connects the two together. And begins to tell us that that impatience that we feel is a symptom of something worse that we ought to be concerned about. Hebrews, again, chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. You've probably read this before too. Take heed, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now listen. For we are made partakers with Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence fast, steadfast, unto the end. That's the same concept we've been talking about. That quiet, enduring, confident patience waiting for God to move holding the beginning of our confidence steadfast all the way through that process until the end when it actually comes through for us. So whenever we begin to become frustrated with God, we really need to check our hearts. Those times when I've become frustrated with God over different issues, you know, I begin to pray about that, I begin to question myself, and the Holy Spirit's spoken to me and revealed it and said, hey, listen, you know, you're, you're going into an area here that... It, You shouldn't really be in. What I'm really saying when I do that is, God, I don't think that you have enough of a handle on the situation anymore to understand the real urgency here. 
I don't think you're sensitive enough to what's taking place in my life to come through for me at the right time when I really, really need you to do it. When you get into that place, the frustration and the impatience that you begin to feel and those emotions that begin to become stirred inside of you, what that actually is, is your desire to take matters into your own hands because you don't think God's going to do it in the time scale that's necessary. And you may not be able to do anything about that situation. You might not physically be able to take matters into your own hands, but you feel the stress of the desire and the urgency to do that nonetheless because you're panicking, you're worrying, you're beginning to lose faith that God is in control of the calendar. And that, when we begin to drift into that, that's unbelief. We're not trusting God, amen, anymore. And unbelief is grounds for us to get down and repent. You know, I've heard people say, you know, oh, you shouldn't make altar calls. You shouldn't do these things, you know, because there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. Well, listen, there definitely is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. But it's possible even when you're in Christ to begin to have, as humans, some of these issues that try and get a grip of our hearts And whenever that takes place for me, I'll get down and say, Lord, I don't want to fall into unbelief. I don't want to give way to impatience that's going to lead me to sin, that's going to lead me to maybe to do stupid things that's going to take me out of your will. God, help me to stay here sensitive to your spirit, aligned with your word, waiting, giving you the credit for being the God who's going to move, that I can trust, that I can rely on. When I stop trusting and relying on God and my emotions and feelings reveal that that's what's taking place in my heart, personally, I need to repent. Amen. Some people can be so impatient with things. You know, me and Pastor Tom have been having some conversations, most of them online through this pandemic, kicking things around, wondering what we can do, you know, sorting plans out and hoping. And one of Pastor Tom's phrases that he loves to use is, you know, let's have a rant about this. (laughs) He likes to rant about some things and and I'll just listen to him because it's good for him to get him off his chest. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, these things are good when we discuss stuff. But it's all these frustrations at the delays and that's taking place. And I know that a lot of people are kind of railing against this pandemic thing, that the lockdown right now. People are losing patience with it. They begin to lose sight of the reason why we did all this in the first place. And they're going, come on, you know, the whole thing is beginning to decay now into a bit of a farce, you know, and people are, are getting that way. But as for me, what I can say, and this is personal for me, is that through this I've developed a whole new level that I never really understood in my relationship with God. And I have more hope, more confidence now that God has every single thing in hand than I have ever experienced. God's dealt with me on this issue of patience in a whole new way. And I'm trusting him. I don't care. I do care, but I don't care how long it's going to take because I know when we can reopen these doors and all my brothers and sisters can gather in these empty seats that you can't see, but I can It's going to be awesome, and it's going to be all the more awesome because God took us through this time of isolation together, and new things have taken place in our hearts. We're going to come back in here with a fire. I I really believe there's going to be a revival, amen, once the churches are able to reopen. We're going to be stirred. People are going to be reached. It's going to be really, really good. In the meantime, while we wait, God is doing something in us. That's the other thing about this patience. God wants to do a work in us many times so that we're able to receive it. And yet we're impatient and we're worrying. Let's just relax. Let's let God have his way. Let's allow God to be God, be in control. The second thing about patience that I want to look at then is that if we have this patience with God, this patience should also cascade down into the way that we deal with one another. So we looked at having patience with God or losing patience with God. How about losing patience with one another? Oh boy, this is a whole different story. This is a whole different story. Because many times, you know, we become so impatient with one another, don't we? Especially with those closest to us where we feel that you know, the relationship is familiar, we can just lapse into impatience, you know, being inconsiderate and you know, maybe like having a harsh word or whatever, because we're just frustrated, we're impatient. You know? And it should not be that way according to the Bible. Listen, 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Now we exhort you, brethren, 
Warn those that are unruly. You say, oh yeah, I love to do that. Comfort the feeble-minded. Maybe. Support the weak. Well, no, that costs me too much. And then it says, be patient toward all men. Oh, that's a hard one. Be patient toward all men. We're going to understand the background to this and how it links into the the, uh, topic we've looked at already in just a minute. Stay with me. Be patient to all men. This is a good doctrine for every single Christian. This is a good doctrine for wives, for husbands, for sons, for daughters, for fathers and mothers, for employers and employees. Patience, 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 especially in the church, especially if you're in leadership or ministry. You really need patience. And if you're not in leadership or ministry, please be patient with those who are because they're doing the very best that they can to bless you. Amen. But none of us are perfect. Listen to this about leadership. 1 Timothy 3.3. 3. It's talking about the qualifications for a bishop here. And it says in verse 3, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, which is grabbing the cash basically, but patient. Patient. Not a brawler, not covetous. And it goes on. And in 2 Timothy 2.24 It says the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach, patient. So patience is a real key thing. We need patience when we deal with people. We need patience because many times it's going to be a struggle dealing with folk. And if you're an impatient person, if you have a short fuse, if you're not able to manage your emotions and the way that you deal with things, then you're going to struggle and you're not going to be able to reach people in a very effective way because you're going to be impatient with them, fly off the handle and they're going to go, I don't need to stick around and hear this. I can go and be shouted at in the pub and off they go. Easy to say, but it's so hard to live out. One of the things to remember here is that patience, long-suffering, is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. God is able to do a supernatural work in our lives in this area. Let me ask you then, as we consider this, how many of you have been frustrated and lost your patience recently with your wife or husband, your son, your daughter, your parent, your pastor? I don't know. The thing is, the reason we lose our patience is, isn't it so frustrating having to deal with people who just don't get it? Amen? Some of you are going, oh yeah, preach that. Listen, you're trying to explain something to them. You're trying to get across a concept to get them to see and to understand and perceive something that's so obvious, so self-evident to you, but they just don't get it. And you're there struggling with these feelings and you're like, oh man, the question of whether I'm intellectually alone in the universe has finally been answered. Why can't they grasp this simple point? It's maddening. Oh God, how can we be patient when people don't get it? How can we be patient when people just refuse or or, are incapable of seeing things from our point of view. If you've ever tried mentoring somebody in any kind of leadership place, you'll know what that feels like. You'll know what that feels like. 2 Timothy 2.25. Let me say that again without getting tongue-tied. 2 Timothy 2.25 gives us a key here, which we'll close with this. We'll round up with this. It says there, In meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves in the hope that God will give to them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So it says we should instruct people in meekness. Those who oppose us, those who don't get it, those who won't receive our point of view, those who are not teachable, those who make themselves difficult to work with either intentionally and deliberately or just because they don't get it. We've got to meekly instruct them. Why? In the hope that God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Notice there, there's a word in there. In the hope that God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. It's God's job. It's not our job. It's not our job to win the argument. It's not our job to fix that person. It's not our job to correct that imperception that's wrong. You know, our job 
is to be patient with people who don't get it. To meekly instruct and try and work with them in meekness and wisdom. It's God's job to give them repentance and open their eyes and make the light bulb go on in their head and their heart so that they can recognize the truth and turn to it. And it's when we're patient with people, when we're meek and humble and long-suffering with people in those kind of relationships, we give God space to do that work. What happens when we lose patience with people is what we're basically doing is we're saying, listen, I know it's God's job to illuminate this person, but he's just taking too long. It's not happening. I need to just get in there and sort this out. And that's what happens. That same faith that we looked at before in relation to our walk with God that lets us continue in patience, knowing that God will answer at the right time and in the right way, that same faith, that same idea and understanding also lets us deal patiently with other people because we know that it's God's job to illuminate them and we know that God is more than capable and able of doing that. I know that there are some people who just resist that and they will not listen till the cows come home. Again, that's their responsibility before God. It's not our job to fix it. Don't you feel the stress falling away when you suddenly realize that it's not your job to fix it? You can be patient with people now because you can say, God, I'm placing my trust in you. I'm humbly going to instruct them. I'm going to share in a spirit of humility. I'm not going to become angry. I'm not going to become stressed. I'm not going to exchange harsh words or let my my emotions flare up, God. I'm just going to stick to your truth. I'm just going to explain. I'm just going to accommodate. And I'm going to trust you, Lord God. You're able to save this person. And if you think, you know, that's all pie in the sky. What about Saul of Damascus? Huh? God was able to save him and he was going around dragging Christians off to court and supervising murder. And if God can save a guy like that, then God can change someone who simply doesn't get it. Amen. This is, you see the faith here. You see the understanding of faith. Faith links with patience. And when faith and patience are linked together, powerful things can happen because we're making room for God to move whether it's in our own personal lives, in the situations that we're dealing with in the world around us, or whether it's in our relationships, the same link and the same thing applies here. This is a key. This is something important. So as we round up tonight, faith and patience. Patience is important. Patience is so important. I wonder how many of you are still patient with me right now by the end of this message. I wonder if you've been patient all the way through. I wonder how your patience has been today. I wonder if you look at your heart when you think about the totality of your life and what you're dealing with, this pandemic and the, the restrictions and the frustrations it places on us. How does that make you feel? Is there a churning in your heart where you're kind of uh, struggling with this? Or are you relaxed? Are you assured? Are you patient, able to trust God that God is going to work great things out? Listen, God is going to bless you. God is going to bless your family. Good things are going to happen. Do not cast away your confidence because it has great recompense of reward. In just a little while, these things will be as memories of yesterday. And new things will be taking place and it's going to be powerful. But the key to receiving the promise, the Bible says, is faith and patience. Faith and patience inherit the promises. How is your patience Take this issue seriously. Consider, check, begin to examine your life. Begin to look at your, the way you speak and the way you deal with people and the things that are floating around in your heart, those emotions, those struggles between you and God and recognize them for what they are. Don't allow circumstances, sometimes engineered by the devil, to nudge you and push you into unbelief and to lose that vital connection with God, that vital belief that God is on your side and he's going to work things out. That's the end of our message for tonight. I hope that was a blessing. Let's just pray this evening. Just allow God to move in this time. And then we're going to hand back over to Pastor Tom in just a moment. Lord, God, we thank you for your faithfulness towards us. Thank you, Lord, that many times, even though we might not get it right, you're always patient with us. God, your patience is incredible. Your long-suffering is incredible. God, that just the way that you've borne with the human race and you do bear with all our infirmities, God, we thank you tonight. We pray, Lord God, that that characteristic of yours 
would be birthed anew in our hearts, God. Give us patience to understand. Give us patience to trust you, that you're working out the time scales, Lord God, according to your own wonderful plan, and it's going to be a blessing, God. Give us the faith, God, to be able to fit into that plan and to willingly wait and commit ourselves to your will, God, that you would work it out in your way, in your time, Lord God, for our great blessing. We know that's what's at stake. And help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, where we've been impatient with others. Help us to trust you that you're going to move in their lives, Lord. And it's not our job to fix people. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you, Lord God, that we're able to study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to hand over to Pastor Tom right now. Quick change. Have patience while there's no one in front of the camera. God bless. If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M36BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you. We're praying for you. And once again, thank you for listening.